Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with Carmen Wilson, a community development expert and the community manager at Demilitarize Education, a world-renowned organization that envisions a world where universities champion peace. She is a world citizen, having grown up in Asia for 14 years, including in Taipei, Beijing, Tokyo, and Manila. She has a BS in Media Management, MA in Globalization and International Development Studies, and completed her dissertation on the importance of freedom of press and information for democratic accountability. Since finishing her MA in 2019, Carmen Wilson has gained a uh, professional certifications in maximizing community impact and nonprofit management. She is a passionate advocate for peace, youth work, critical discourse, and education. Also a former ESL teacher, as am I, and passionate about using communications technologies to promote access to quality education. Uh, Carmen Wilson, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm joining from Manchester, England uh, today. So tell us about Demilitarized Education and what it's working on. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so I'm originally from the United States, but right now I'm living and working in the UK um, to build the, the peace movement here from within the UK. Um, and our focus is really working with students and specifically university students to get them to um, uncover information about their university ties to the arms trade and even more than that, use this evidence to pressure them to commit to demilitarize and become champions for peace as all of our uh, higher education institutions should be. <laughs> uh, I live in the United States where universities uh, are hand in glove with weapons companies and mm -hmm. they have Lockheed Martin Day on campus and the corporations have, you know, their recruiters. Uh, uh, I, I thought uh, in other countries, universities would teach peace. Uh, what, what, what is the state of universities in uh, the United Kingdom? Oh gosh, yeah, that that assumption, um, you know, you would think that UK universities would, would teach peace, but um, we like to say the way that these partnerships take shape is very British, you know, it's, it's really covert and it's not as in your face as in America. Um, you know, so we're working to really uncover these partnerships, like where the money is coming from and what it's being used for. Um, yeah, so within the UK, it's, um, there's also this massive, you know, revolving door between arms companies, the Ministry of Defense, and using students, their money, their fees, their, their talent, their smarts and, and using it, you know, to put towards weapons development. Um, so it, it is a really big problem around the world, not just in the States. Yeah. Well, some uh, some universities in the UK have peace studies departments, just like in the US, but uh, obviously mm -hmm. not most of them. And it's not where the money comes from. Um, what? Uh, so, so what are you what's your approach? Uh, to changing this? Yeah, yeah, really good question. Um, so since Demilitarized Education started as an organization or DED, Deducation for short, um, we've been working on developing a model. So a full-fledged, uh, planned out strategic model for how these universities can demilitarize um, and what we've broken it down into is three years and three phases. Um, and what's really exciting is that we're launching the first phase um, this upcoming September. And we're going to start with 
the engagement of students and the university community, um, engaging them in the need to demilitarize and um, working with them to teach them the skills, to motivate them and to provide them with a community of support so that they can, you know, take charge and be leaders in demilitarizing their universities. So yeah, we're gonna be launching this September and the engagement phase really means uh, we're gonna be hosting two month cycles. So I'm promoting, you know, the signing up of these cycles and it's gonna take place Every two months, we're gonna have six sessions and each session is really just a practical workshop that's gonna give these students and those within the university community the, the skills they need to um, you know, make impactful contributions to our database. So what do I mean by database? Um, if you know, your listeners can go to our website. It's deadone.co. Um, we have the world's first university and arms database, and it focuses on uh, universities. So through this database, you can upload anything from a university's policies to FOI requests that um, we've, we've taught our members to send out the university administration's responses to the FOI requests. And even more than that, we're gonna have an action tracker. Uh, Cause what we've noticed is that a lot of students get really excited and, and passionate about these issues. They wanna get involved, maybe they go to a protest, but there's not that much momentum that's being kept, especially with students, they, they go to school for in America four years, in the UK for three. They graduate and then the momentum is lost and those campaign actions that, you know, the previous student leaders and, and students had been building, like it's lost. So that is one of our core, you know, ideas of our organization is that we're not just guiding these students, but we're providing them with a central platform for them to keep coming back and keep making impact. In, uh, in the United States, at least, including a university right down the street from me here, they own stock in weapons companies. They profit from weapons companies. They take funding from weapons companies. They take course material, they teach information from weapons companies. They do joint projects with the military of, of the United States and with weapons companies. They set up office parks across the street from US military facilities and jointly work on weapons development. I mean, there's, there's 18 different ways that they're interlocked with the weapons industry and the military. And if you wanna change that, you have to go after, you know, a, a what they call a board of visitors, a bunch of corporate uh, big shots that don't live, you know, within a within 500 miles of here, uh, appointed by a governor with no accountability. Uh, I mean, what are you going to try to change specifically, and who do you have to move to to change those things? Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. Like over the last 20 years, for example, we've seen this trend with universities. Um, in the UK, for example, the government, um, they weren't giving as much money to universities. So universities had to start looking for that money elsewhere. Um, and they've really turned into acting like private companies. Um, and they're, they seem to be more focused on the bottom line, you know, and in being uh, uh, competitive in the marketplace and having the, the most innovative, you know, programs and things like that. So, yeah, it, it really is going to be about um, working from within the university community, within the university system to use students as, you know, that that powerful force um, because students 
they provide the most money to universities through their fees. Uh, this is definitely not the case as much in the UK with our fees being so small compared to in America. Um, but yeah, and these university leaders, the administration, they're not listening to their students. They're not informing them about where their student fees are going. Um, so it is really going to be using students to get to these university administrators. Um, and it is a really complex system to work within. Um, you know, you can't just Google, how do I create investment policy reform <laughs> within higher education? You, you can't just Google this. Um, so yeah, that's where, you know, us working with many different kinds of roles within the higher education system is going to be really important. Um, so we're actually working with Save the Children, um, which is one of our national partners here. And so starting next week, we're going to be engaging and training uh, student union leaders and representatives. These are elected by the student body. And so they're in a position of power and we believe they should use this power for good. It, it, it those low fees, uh, education as more of a right than an insane privilege uh, has have got to help, right? Because when the students have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt upon graduation, uh, those jobs that pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars of government money through the weapons companies have to be appealing uh, when they say, you know, when students say, well, I'd love to have a job as a peace activist. Well, where can I get one that pays lots of money? Uh, I mean, what do you say? What do you say to a student like that? Right. I mean, there's, there's, some existing research that proves how lucrative investing in peace and peaceful innovation and development is, but um, that's that is a, you know something that we often hear and that we do need to combat. Um, yeah, what's really really shameful is that these universities are working with, for example, BAE Systems, the UK's largest um, arms company. They're working with BAE on um, degree, they, they're called apprenticeships here, but I guess you could say like an internship. Um, and they're saying, okay, we're gonna pay your student fees, so free education, we're going to give you a salary, we're gonna give you all this training with the high tech equipment and the, you know, the the world's leading innovator in, you know, engineering, and they make it seem like a really cushy opportunity um, for many students who might come from, you know, a disadvantaged background. It sounds like a, an amazing opportunity that they can't miss out on. Um, but this is, of course, manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. Um you uh so so you're going to educate these students uh and i know uh, on the website which is ded numeral one dot co right dead one dot co uh you've got uh seven myths that sustain the global arms trade um can we can we start debunking those myths for people <laughs> yes of course uh i know that uh you have a particular interest in uh debunking myths <laughs> uh, as I participated in your, you know, leaving World War II behind uh, course. But yeah, so this project, we've actually been working on it for a few years now. Um, and myth one is out now on our YouTube channel and you can follow us on social media. Um, our handle is at DED underscore U C A T I O N education. Um, and what really fits in with our overall strategic, you know, pillars is that we use media to make this these issues more understandable, more digestible, and we use media to make 
um, you know, evidence and facts more accessible to people. Um, you know, growing up, I thought peace building was reserved for the, you know, older generation, maybe the, the typical protesting and, you know, hippies of the sixties and seventies. Um, and like, we've heard from many young activists that they really struggled in knowing how to get involved. Um, and yeah, maybe you can read this book, you know, um, which is a great book. Um, and, you know, we worked with um, the authors to break it down. Um, so it's called Indefensible, Seven Myths That Sustain the Global Arms Trade. Um, and yeah, myth one debunks the idea that higher defense spending leads to higher security. So it really is about like shifting the conversation away from this idea that violence and weapons and arms are, are, are a necessity for this idea of security. So yeah, check yeah, it out. It, uh... <laughs> I, 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 it, it seems like a, such a sensible idea, right? The more you spend on weapons, the more the evil foreigners will leave you alone. Uh, and, and yet the data, we're supposed to follow the science, follow the facts, mm -hmm. learn from the data. The data suggests just the opposite. The nations that spend the most on weapons and ships and planes and foreign bases generate the most wars and hostility and enemy terrorist groups uh and yet we're supposed to somehow ignore that uh, it's a very strange education system uh that that can tolerate these myths because the facts are the facts aren't that hard to find i think yeah yeah exactly so maybe it's less about um you know finding this information um which a lot of you know a lot of educated people within this sphere they they know how to find this information and uh i think it's more about okay now that i have this information what can i do with it you know like okay yeah. so how can, how can i have an impact exactly um and for many young people who who are really engaged in issues of sustainability, social justice, um, you know, peace building, they want to get involved. They just don't know how. It was definitely a problem for me. Oh, we're speaking with Carmen Wilson of Demilitarized Education. Carmen, how did you and why did you get involved in this? Ooh, yeah, good question, David. Yeah, my story is a really interesting one. Um, it's pretty unique in that uh, both of my parents were in the military. So, you know, both of my parents are U.S. veterans. Um, and then beyond that, because I grew up in Asia for 14 years, um, it was a result of my, my dad's job. He was a high-level official within the CIA. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't aware of that actually for most of my life until around 13 years of age. Um, and, and it's a, right around that time that you begin to start thinking critically about the world. Um, so it really sparked a lot of critical thought within me about, you know, what what is the what is the role of you know the US military overseas and how does US militarism take shape in in other countries and it was pretty clear i could see it uh you know whether it was the clear i'm seeing US soldiers <laughs> walking around with big guns um and you know they told us within the U.S. diplomatic community that this presence of the U.S. military was supposed to make us feel safer. Yeah. Mm. It didn't work, huh? It didn't no. make you feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I, I was just like, hmm. 
I, it's a little strange. I, I wonder in the UK if the contrast between the UK and and Spain, um, what I think of as very recently, but maybe is ancient history uh, to you. Um, but in the, in the early 2000s, uh, there were terrorist attacks, Middle Eastern terrorist attacks in both London and Madrid. Uh, and in the UK, the response was, well, we must build more weapons, send more troops, kick in more doors, bomb more villages. In Spain, it was, we must swear we will get every last Spanish troop out of Iraq immediately, and we will not take part in these wars anymore, and we will not engage in the behavior that generates this hatred and this terrorism. Uh, mm -hmm. So completely different approaches. One resulted in ongoing hostility and more terrorist attacks and more wars. And, and the other, you know, there's not been a foreign bomb in Spain from that day to this, right? There's not, there are no anti-Spanish terrorist groups. Uh, and, and the myth, the logic that we were talking about before would suggest that, you know, Spain would have been leveled by now, right? Uh, and uh, do, do people in the UK think about this sort of contrast? Yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely think, especially since Brexit that many people within the UK, um, they like to differentiate themselves from countries within the EU. Um, you know, but that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting point. Um, and it, it just sort of relates to the idea that, you know, what is security? Is it getting more weapons and getting more, you know, troops out there? Or is it actually trying to understand what could really bring peace? Um, you know, I, I, I was in Spain in 2019, and it was really interesting to me because I saw the police officers walking around, they looked like they were in the SWAT or something. They had these really, really big guns. Um, oh, right, but it, it, it didn't make me feel any kind of way. Whereas in the UK, we are seeing this increase in, the, in policing, you know, in an in increase in a police type state, um, but we don't have many cops walking around with guns. Um, so it is really interesting to, to see like, you know, what, what perceptions people are having about, about this. <laughs> I think that is a very useful topic for you to be educating people in the United States about uh, the mm. fact that that a, a country very, very similar uh, to the U.S. in many, many ways has police who walk around policing without guns, uh, just because it would strike people in the United States as insane, if not impossible. Um, mm. I, I, I have a friend, uh, Lindis Percy, a peace activist in Yorkshire, who goes and protests the big, you know, NSA spy base there uh, in in Yorkshire, uh, and a policeman once showed up with a gun and she protested vehemently and insisted he leave and come back without a gun before they would talk with him. Uh, and he did, you know, I mean, wow. this, this is not something that could happen in the United States. Um, I, I, I don't know, do you, do you work with people in the U.S. or in other countries on similar work? Is there much exchange of ideas about demilitarizing education uh, in the various countries? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we consider ourselves a proud member of, um, you know, the World Peace Force. Um, and, you know, we're happy to be collaborating with World Beyond War um, since me specifically working with you guys, I've, you know, I've spoken with a lot of 
um, peace activists within the UK. And I'm just really interested in, in those similarities and differences, you know, um, Actually, I spoke with a um, peace activist from my home state of, of New Mexico, and um, we got into a really nice discussion about, uh, well, not nice because it is you know, not a good thing, but talking about um, how the state of New Mexico has increased their spending for um, nuclear uh, weapons development. Meanwhile, our social services and our human development initiatives are, you know, being left in the dust. So, um, yeah, with me, my, my particular interest is like, what can I learn from, from the peace building movement in, in other countries? And especially not just talking to young people, but, you know, talking to the older generations, really seeing what we can learn from one another. I, I hope in the in the coming uh, weeks and months we will learn something from demilitarized education uh, about what works uh, and what doesn't uh, in in universities uh, in the UK. Um, what uh, yeah. we we've got just a, a few minutes left. What are what are some of your your hopes for the for the coming work your your initial projects here? Yeah, no, good question. Um, so our main objective is for every two month cycle that we um, run, we're gonna be hosting these sessions on our Discord channel. Um, and I'm not sure if you know what Discord is, but you know, it's like a community platform for everyone to come um, and collaborate, discuss. So we want to engage um, all UK universities with the opportunity of signing our treaty. So we have some key tools that we're using in the implementation of our model. We have a treaty, a policy brief, and a petition. So the purpose of the treaty is, and what that commitment will mean is that these universities are saying, okay, I commit to demilitarize. I'm gonna end all of my partnerships with arms companies and um, the military or the Ministry of Defense. I'm going to end all research academic partnerships. I'm going to remove, right? I'm going to divest all of my money. And, and then more than that, I'm going to um, reform my policies so that I can't have these kinds of partnerships in the future. And I'm going to reinvest in peace. Like you mentioned, there are areas of study, peace studies, but actually many academics have told me that they don't talk that much about peace. <laughs> Mostly talk this, about this, peace. Yeah. this will be, uh, the next time we have you on, this will be the conversation. Why, why isn't peace studies uh, talking about war and peace? Uh, because we do need we need that work as well. Uh, we, we've been speaking with Carmen Wilson. The, the project is called Demilitarized Education. You can go to ded1.co. Uh, Carmen, thank you for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, everyone, if you want to check out what we're doing or if you really want to get involved, visit our website or check us out on social media. We're going to be having lots of exciting opportunities for you to get involved, learn some skills and become a leader in demilitarizing your university. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.